Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. The CSIR released a report this week showing that South Africa's electricity shortfall for the coming three years is far worse than first thought. Terence Creamer joins me to discuss the report, as well as what it could mean for ESCOM, business and the economy. Hi Terence. Hi Fino. What in your view is the main takeaway from the CSIR report? I think the, the main issue is that <coughs> the supply-demand imbalance is a lot bigger than we thought it was. We knew that uh, with the integrated resource plan released in October last year, <coughs> we knew that we had uh, an immediate capacity gap of about 3,000 megawatts. But the energy gap wasn't as clear and the load shedding looked like it could be managed. So uh, there was a bit more, I suppose, feeling about that we could take some time to remedy the situation. This one uh, report, the updated report, which really takes the most recent information looking at the performance of the uh, Eskom fleet, so the medium term system adequacy report, which came out uh, late last year, and then extrapolates some assumptions from that. And I think the key deviation in the assumptions is that the energy availability factor from the Eskom fleet has deteriorated faster than it was, uh, to a worse position than it was anticipated in the integrated resource plan. And it's likely that that trend is not going to be reversed as quickly. So the integrated resource plan thinks by uh, 2022, we'll have a 75% energy availability factor. The CSIR model suggests that it's actually going to deteriorate further from the 67% that it is currently and could go down to the sort of 64% level before it starts recovering. So that leaves a massive gap, capacity-wise and energy gap that uh, therefore is going to have to be filled either by new supply side generation, demand reduction, um, and ultimately, if not, load shedding. And I think the stark sort of, um, sort of picture that's painted by this report is that 2019 was our worst load shedding year to date. So going back all the way back to when it started in 2006, 2008 period, and uh, that we sort of had over 1,300 gigawatt hours, about over 530 hours of power cuts in 2019. And that led to an economic loss uh, estimated, depends on what value you, you put to the nature of unserved energy or the cost of unserved energy, anywhere between 60 uh, billion and 120 billion. And we see now some of the companies are starting to report their, their first the end of your results or their quarterly results, and we're starting to see those figures starting to materialize in some of the mining company, for instance, results, that this has a real impact. But what the, the picture painted in this uh, CSIR study is that given this energy availability factor trend is downwards um, and there's no immediate supply relief because we know Madupi and Kusile have been struggling to meet nameplate and they're going to take some time to get there. Um, and then we know that we haven't been running regular bid windows for any other capacity and uh, energy. And therefore, the gap this year is going to be materially larger and therefore will have to be closed by a lot more load shedding unless something happens. And, uh, or, and then it grows really quite dramatically over the next three years. So this year, much higher than last year, which was our worst on record. And by 2022, sort of 4,600 gigawatt hours of, of power cuts unless something dramatic changes. How does this align with what ESCOM is doing and saying? Well, it aligns quite well, unfortunately, <laughs> because we know that ESCOM has taken a look at its uh, existing coal-fired power stations again. And we know that the message there is that the plant is in a lot worse state uh, than, had, uh, than was anticipated. And therefore, that's manifesting in these very, very high levels of unplanned uh, breakdowns. So when we had that uh, dramatic day, 9th of December, um, when we cut 6,000 megawatts of, of uh, uh, capacity from the system, owing to uh, that was stage six load shedding, that day uh, about 15,000 megawatts of breakdowns was reported. And uh, that sort of led to very few options because there was other plant out for maintenance, including the one unit at Kuburg that was being refueled and hadn't been brought back yet, there was no other option but to ramp up the load shedding dramatically. 
since we've come back in January and uh, we've had this consistent um, 10,000 to 14,000, maybe 14,500 megawatts of unplanned breakdown. So we're still in a very, very precarious position. And Eskim is saying it's not going to really get better until it's, uh, as to use the, the, the new CEO's analogy, until they get off the bicycle that they're running alongside, put the chain back on and start pedaling. We're going to continue with this pattern. And to do that means you need time and space. Time and space means that you need to take more plant out for longer periods. Taking more plant out for longer periods means there's going to be a gap between supply and demand. What that gap is um, will depend day to day. But on, a, on an average, Eskim saying maybe they're looking at a maintenance uh, type philosophy where maybe they can only guarantee 25,000 megawatts. Now that's very little if you think of a system that's over 45,000 megawatts. So, so quite a lot, uh, over 20,000 megawatts out uh, for some sort of maintenance or, um, or repair or otherwise it's not really a base load operation. So it's a lot of uh, capacity that they want to maintain and get back into some working order. And that's going to take time. So it, the picture that we're getting, so and during that time, the EAF is going to deteriorate. So the picture aligns almost perfectly, I think, with the CSIR. We, um, the CSIR, I don't think, is an overly pessimistic picture. I think it's a realistic picture, and I think one that Eskim will probably agree with. Um, maybe on the margins it will say that the AAF can be recovered faster, but on the whole it's saying it needs time and space to recover the fleet, and the fleet's been run too hard for too long, and that time and space is really the short-term gap that CSIR sh shows between 2020 and the end of 2022, where at the moment, absent everything else, the only way to close it is through rotational power cuts. What actions are suggested for dealing with this crisis? So that's, uh, I suppose, the good news in the CSIR report is that it, it, it points to a range of solutions, um, all of which are in sort of the, the power of government, government departments or regulators to make some impact on. So it's not something that it's totally out of our hands. We can actually do something around uh, closing the gap. The immediate thing is for ESKIM, which is a state-owned enterprise, to get its Madupi and Kusili and its EIF recovery okay. plans in place. Um, both those will take some time, as I as sort of alluded to in the earlier questions. The other thing is to do what they say, really lean on the customer at scale, or self-generation at scale. Now, this requires a change to the regulations. At the moment, the regulations are, um, so the, the people that want to do the self-generation are mired in red tape. We've discussed this several times before. If you sub uh, uh, one megawatt, you have to register. Even that process with NERSA takes some time. If you're above one megawatt, you have to license. That process definitely takes some time. And if you're above 10 megawatts, there's a lacuna. There's a policy or regulatory lacuna. And that's where a lot of um, mining companies or larger companies that want to self-generate, they're in that sort of space. They can do, I suppose, multiple sub-10 megawatt plants, but it's really not optimal. So we need a basically a change to the regulation that really has to come from the Department of Minerals and Energy. The other thing is we have to get the bid windows, the procurement going. That won't close the immediate gap uh, because it takes some time. We have a very rigorous uh, rules around procurement, public procurement, and we know already through a very successful renewable energy power purchase program that these take months. Uh, you have to tick all the boxes. You have to do this properly, especially in an environment where it's been where we've had other procurement prone to corruption. But you need to get that 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 moving. It's not going to close the short term gap, but towards the outer years, some of that plant can come in. Then there's the existing fleets of renewables. Where all the most of the many of the renewables companies are saying they can do more, if you just they're really curtailing some of their energy, if they are just given the incentive to do that and the green light to do that, uh, the, uh, through a sort of power purchase agreement or a new contract that supplements the existing one, they can move ahead with that. So that gives you a little bit more, and that's immediate. Something that's a low hanging fruit, along with the small scale embedded generation on rooftops, the embedded generation at mines and factories and the distributed generation at mines, factories, farms that may require wheeling. Those are your sort of quickest hit 
items and the CSR has actually put numbers to that and we can start uh, seeing results. And then obviously we've got the emergency procurement pro program of the DMRE run by the IPP of office. That really, it's quite astounding to me when you know at least the 3,000 uh, megawatt capacity gap. We published an RP in October and we only really got that process moving uh, towards the end of the year. We now have an evaluation, uh, well we have closer at the end of January, we have an evaluation for a whole month and then only then we'll have ministerial determinations and uh, the procurement process uh, moving. It's, it's quite outrageous, it's almost economic sabotage what's happening and actually uh, that's what this, the, the, the CSR report shows, that there's a lot of things if that can be done very quickly, decisions that can be done very quickly to start easing this uh, supply-demand imbalance. Absent urgency and the CSR are saying first quarter is the outer envelope for these decisions. Um, we are going to experience more load shedding more frequently and at higher stages. That's the reality, that's the sad reality in the report. That's the science, uh, it's an evidence-based scientific s uh, study. You can tweak the assumptions here and there but they're not going to change much. And uh, I think what we need now is for the authorities to look at the report and look at the recommendations and start implementing. Thank you. That's the second Take Show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our Engineering News Daily Email Newsletter.